Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. Having looked at uh, different kinds of embedded and main clauses in uh, English in the last unit, we're now going to talk about the theoretical application of X-bar theory to CPs, or complementizer phrases. Uh, in our old phrase structure rule system, we had CP goes to optional C followed by TP. There's a number of problems with this, right? Um, the first is is that the head is optional. And the second is there's no bar level. Um, but it's a relatively uh, trivial matter to put CPs into X bar format, as in the tree you see right here. Um, now, you might look at this and say, uh, what is that specifier there for? And can you have adjuncts to CPs? These are great questions. The specifier of CP is a place we're going to um, move question phrases like what and when and where into. It's the position that we're going to use specifically for those WH question phrases. Um, the complement position is pretty clearly a, almost always a TP, um, if not always. Adjuncts are a little trickier. There may be some arguments for some CP-level adjuncts, like uh, uh, frequently, or um, yesterday, or phrases like that that seem to modify the finiteness or modify the, um, modify the clause as a whole, or, or other ones might include um, expect, expectedly. Um, the kinds of things that modify the clause as a whole might be adjuncts to the, C, to the CP. All right, let's move on to some uh, discussion of this CP structure. First of all, you might ask the question, is there a CP in every clause? I've sort of hinted before in previous videos that we would want to have a CP on every clause. Uh, but you're immediately left with at least two cases where uh, it looks like you might not have CPs. So take, for example, um, embedded clauses without complementizers, like I said Louise loved rubber duckies, and main clauses by themselves. Louise loved rubber duckies. Um, the, the, um, the lack of a complementizer in the embedded clause is uh, a, a sign of optionality. In main clauses, you actually cannot have a complementizer appear um, in those positions. But there's good reason to think that, there, that despite this optionality in embedded clauses and the unavailability of um, complementizers in main clauses is actually, is actually illusory. And there is, in fact, a CP on top of every clause. It's just that sometimes that complementizer is null. If you've already looked at the video on DPs, you'll see that we made this exact same claim about DPs, that sometimes there are null determiners. So we're going to claim that sometimes there are null complementizers as well. So and what's the evidence for this? So the evidence for this comes from yes-no questions and a phenomenon known as subject ox inversion. So take a sentence like, you have seen the rubber ducky. The question form of this, the yes-no question form, is have you seen the rubber ducky? Now notice that uh, what happens in English is you invert the subject and the auxiliary. But in many, many languages, yes-no questions are not formed this way. They're formed instead by putting a special complementizer particle in, in at, right at the beginning of the sentence or right at the end of the sentence in languages that are head final. So in head initial languages, like Irish here, you get a special uh, particle that means question, ar ak shown. Now what we find about these particles is that they're actually in complementary distribution with complementizers in embedded contexts. So you either get one of these particles or you get a complementizer, but you can't have both. So 
Um, one proposal is that these are in fact a special kind of complementizer that we're going to mark with the feature plus Q for question. And they sit in front of clauses that are questions. This actually um, explains something about the nature of what complementizers are for. Complementizers are about setting, <clears throat> setting the standard for what the speaker feels about the sentence that they're uttering. Is it a statement? Is it a question? Is it an order? The complementizer functions as a mechanism for indicating the speaker's attitude towards the expression. All right, so what happens when we have a yes, no question is we have one of these question uh, in English. We have one of these question complementizers, but in English it happens to be null. So there is no overt form like the Irish has the, the form R. Instead, what we have is the, is the null form. Well, that would be problematic if that's our only means of indicating a yes-no question. So one solution English has here is to take the auxiliary and move it into this complementizer position. This is our first instance of a phenomenon we are going to call head movement, where you move one head into another head. And it results in uh, a structure where the complementizer, uh, which now contains the auxiliary, appears before the subject, and you get the subject ox inversion. We have two means of indicating this relationship. The first is on the tree on the left, where we have the word have starting out in the T head, which is right where it normally is. And we indicate that it moves into the null complementizer using an arrow, um, pointing up into that position. So the idea is that the have moves into that position, inverting the U and the have. The tree on the right is an alternative representation of the same set of facts. So instead of having the arrow and the base position of the auxiliary, we indicate where the auxiliary ends up, which is to the left of the subject, tucked in there underneath the complementizer with the null question complementizer. And we indicate the original position of the auxiliary with a little italic T. That italic T stands for trace and indicates where the element has moved from. Either representation is fine. They both indicate that what happens is when you have a null question complementizer in English, you have to do subject ox inversion. So what's the evidence that we have these null uh, question complementizers in English. And in fact, we're doing this head-to-head -head movement operation. And the evidence comes from a phenomenon of complementarity, as in complementary distribution. What we find is that when we have a subject ox inversion, we are not permitted to have a complementizer. So let's just uh, look at what I mean by that. English has a plus Q complementizer that's found in embedded clauses. It's if. So this if uh, is only found in embedded clauses, but it has the basic function of indicating that there's a question involved, even though it's an indirect question in this sentence. I wonder if Louise likes rubber duckies. The interesting thing is that if is in complete complementary distribution with subject ox inversion. You can't say, I wonder if has Louise owned a rubber ducky. If you have the question complementizer, the embedded question does not have subject ox inversion. It has to be, I wonder if Louise has owned a rubber ducky. So subject ox inversion seems to be correlated with the absence of an overt complementizer. That means they're in complementary distribution. It also means that we can use subject to ox inversion as a diagnostic for the presence of a complementizer in English. So now we're going to make this argument a little more complicated. But let's just review the basics behind it. Root questions in English contain a phonologically null plus Q complementizer, which triggers the auxiliary to raise to it to give it some phonological content. Otherwise, you would have no phonological indication that something is a question or not. So when we have subject ox inver inversion, we know we have a complementizer. Now, what about evidence that non-questions have null complementizers? 
there's a, a, a tricky little argument here. Remember that our conjunction rule says you can only link things together in the same category. So you can only link together noun phrases with noun phrases, and adjective phrases with adjective phrases, and verb phrases with verb phrases, etc. So, if you've got a sentence with the subject oxen version, that means you have to have a CP for that clause. For that sentence, to have subject oxen version, there has to be a CP. If you can conjoin that with a clause that doesn't have subject oxen version, it follows because of the conjunction properties that that clause must also have a complementizer phrase. So here's our sentence to prove this. You can say, you can lead a horse to water, but can you make him drink? So what's critical about this sentence is that in the second conjunct, can you make him drink, we have subject ox inversion. We take this to be evidence of a null question complementizer. So there is clearly a CP on top of this sentence with the subject ox inversion. But because we have the conjunction but, that means that the elements to the left of the but must also be a CP, because you can only conjoin CPs with CPs. Because the second clause has a null complementizer, which is and triggers subject ox inversion, the first clause must also have a null complementizer. So let's look what that let's see what that would look like in a tree. And we've got this tree here where we've got the subject ox inversion, can you make him drink, in the right-hand portion of the tree, where the T node is moving into the, to the complementizer position to give you the subject ox inversion. That entails there's a CP. But the, and therefore, what's going to have to be on the left-hand side is also a CP. It's just a minus Q complementizer, which does not trigger subject ox inversion. So what's our conclusion to take away from this? This means that all clauses, including um, statements and main clauses, have CPs, even if that complementizer head is null. This parallels exactly our discussion of DPs, where DPs, we argued, had to have a, deter uh, had to have a determiner even if there was nothing overt. So even for nouns like John, we had to propose that there was a null determiner. This explains the weird functional category exceptions to the headedness rules of our phrase structure rules. Instead, we have simply have null functional categories that appear in the structure.